You've got a rage oh, problem, snap. right? It's not a problem! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem is a full-on reboot of the beloved 80s cartoon. It's well animated, action-packed, and funny. And the best part is that since it's a reboot, fans of all ages and all levels of turtle knowledge can enjoy this one. Likewise, since it's a reboot, we start fresh with new younger iterations of the characters and their moralities. With great turtle power comes great turtle responsibility, but which characters really take that to heart? I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, Good to Evil. We've got a shell of a lot to go through, so let's get started with the most heroic character and work our way down to the most evil. These characters are the good. I for one will never use the word rat as an insult again after seeing Splinter in action. Initially, like most parents in teenage movies, he's portrayed as an antagonistic light, refusing to allow the turtles any contact with the evil humans of the outside world. But you'd be wrong to mistake Splinter for anything but pure hearted. In fact, despite his own reservations due to being constantly mistreated by humans. He actually tried to go into the human world because of how much the brothers wanted to. This resulted in him being attacked and Mikey nearly being hit by a truck. So it's not hard to see why he's a little overprotective. He takes home the gold medal of good for two main reasons. The first is obviously his devotion to the boys, placing their happiness and safety above all else, and even saving them on a few occasions, in addition to him stopping Mikey from getting run over. Later on, he fights off a whole army of Cynthia Utram's soldiers to save them. And at one point, he tried to bring the human world down to the sewers with a handmade restaurant experience and some cardboard cutouts of humans, all to make his boys happy. As for the second reason, Splinter has a solid redemption arc in terms of his mindset. In fact, he's the one who encourages the turtles and the other mutants to rise up against Super Duper Fly in the final battle and pushes them to show the world just how cool they are. When Super Fly parallels his own words of his way of thinking, being the only way to happiness and safety, he's heartbroken at what he's done and determined to find a way to support his sons in their desire to live normal lives alongside humanity. A good parent and a hero who's constantly striving to be better at both. How could he not be our top pick? Though him eating his dead cockroach friend is kind of questionable. The silver medal of good goes to the one-of-a-kind party turtle, Mikey. The smallest and most outwardly nice of the turtles, Mikey is the type of guy who views everything and everyone around him with a sort of childlike innocence. Whether they're mutants in Superfly's gang, humans like April and his end of the movie classmates, or anything in between. Anyone can be a friend in Mikey's book. We place him so high because it seems as though he doesn't even have the capability to have ill will towards anyone. Seriously, even when he and the others are fighting against Superfly's gang, he can't help but apologize for crashing Mondo Gecko's car and sending him through the window. He's also the first to question how Splinter will feel about the brother's plan to fight Superfly in the first place, showing that he's always got the feelings of others on the forefront of his mind. Whether you need a hand in combat, Bad or just to pass you another slice of pizza, Mikey is too pure for this world. But if you thought he was great, the bronze medal of good winner, Mondo Gecko, is righteous. Out of all of Superfly's minions who turned out to have an interesting shift in their motives by the movie's third act, Mondo Gecko still manages to stand out as the most outright good of the bunch. For one, when Superfly reveals his plan to wipe out humanity to the turtles, Gecko expresses that he genuinely wishes there was another way to feel happy and safe. This isn't a killing spree to Gecko. My dude literally just wants to live and let live. When the turtles confront Superfly and the mutants to tell them they can all live together and figure out how to integrate into human society, instead of just wiping them out, Gecko is the first one to openly defy Superfly's orders, inspiring the others to do the same and join the turtles. It's also notable that he and Mikey vibed on an equal level immediately, which takes a whole new level of chill. Landing just outside of our top three is the leader of the turtles, Leonardo, or Leo. Admittedly, he doesn't make the best first impression after Splinter questions the brothers about where they've been, he immediately throws them under the bus by revealing they'd defied him and gone to a movie unsupervised. While Leo's heart is in the right place, only wanting to protect them from trouble from the outside world they've been trained to fear, it's still a bit nasty of him to be so quick to snitch on his brothers. That said, Leo's by-the-book way of thinking does have its benefits too. He always insists on doing the right thing, regardless of how dangerous it may be, and he's able to encourage the strengths of each of his brothers individually in the final battle. Leo is like a good older brother in real life. Sure, you might hate him sometimes in his stick-in-the-mud moments, but at the end of the day, you know you've got someone to fall back on. Okay, side note, apparently Leonardo's voice actor
character in this movie also played Gumball Watterson. The reason I say that is because I would have sworn that was true of Donatello. Yeah, that's that's his transition, but don't worry, there's more to say about him. Being the main nerd of the group, Donatello is the most clever of the turtles. Whether he's using his knowledge of Attack on Titan to figure out how to take out Super Duper Fly, which was a super cool reference, by the way, or absolutely roasting the hell out of his brothers, like telling Mikey his head looked like Stewie Griffin had a baby with Hey Arnold. Not only is it funny, it feels exactly like the insult of a 15-year-old. Aside from his penchant for insults, Donnie is a nice guy. He's a bit more cynical than Leo or Mikey before him, but he's no less willing to help save the day and no less loyal to his brothers. He's just a bit more straight to the point is all, and he will absolutely end your career with his insults. Worth a quick mention for our next spot is singing sensation Ray Philly, another one of Superfly's mutant buddies. He'd rather be singing than causing chaos in New York City. much to Superfly's annoyance. He gets very little screen time, but we felt he deserves his own slot for the simple reason that he's, along with Mondo Gecko, the most peaceful of Superfly's found family, as well as the very second to question his evil plan. At the very end of the good characters is resident reporter in training, April O'Neil. Now, if there's anything that can be said about April, it's that she's honest. When the Turtles asked her if there were more humans like her who would accept them, she straight up denied it. On top of bluntness, she also has pretty selfish motivations, only wanting to help the Turtles take down Superfly so she can report on it and push her career forward, healing her wounded high school reputation as Puke Girl in the process. When the Turtles are captured, she seemingly runs away and flakes on them. While this would place her very low, we're willing to forgive her because of her role in the third act. She helped the Turtles by getting Splinter's attention, convincing him that some humans were alright, and even reporting on live news that the mutants fighting Superfly were good guys working to protect the city. And yeah, she did puke at the end, but credit where credit is due. With the good section wrapped up, we now enter more neutral territory. These characters fall in the gray area. This one might break a few hearts, but kicking off the gray area section is the last of the brothers, Raphael. Raph has always been the most short-tempered, impulsive, and overall violent of the turtles, but mutant mayhem really kicks it up a few hundred notches. He enjoys causing destruction wherever he goes. In one scene, he interrogates one of Superfly's minions, and after he gives him the information they need, Raph just punches him anyway. Later on, in the aforementioned scene where Mikey says sorry to Mondo Gecko for knocking him out of the truck, Raph assures him that he himself is not sorry in the slightest. While he is a bit mean and a lot more than a bit violent, it is hard to blame him. After all, he is just a teenager who's frustrated with the fact that he's been taught that society will shun him, so he can never be a full part of it. He also saves Donnie from being hit by a fallen car thrown by Superfly, showing that at the end of the day, he'll do anything to protect his loser brothers. Hopefully, he actually gets that therapy the movie was joking about, but for now, we feel like this is a comfortable placement for him. While we're in the neutral territory, let's go on and mention the other mutants. Wingnut, Bebop and Rocksteady, Leatherhead, Scumbag, and Genghis Frog. First of all, let's just say that the existence of a character named Genghis Frog is awesome. Secondly, you might wonder why we placed all these guys so much lower than Mondo Gecko and Ray Philly. The answer is simple. For those two, we saw point blank that they're peace-loving, gentle, friendly people. We certainly see good qualities in the others, but what sets them apart is that they are a bit less sad about the whole murdering all humans part of Superfly's plan. That said, they're not even close to evil, especially considering they join the other mutants to fight against Superfly by the end of the movie. And rounding out our gray area, we have Baxter Stockman, who actually only appears in the first couple minutes of the movie. That said, he's surprisingly crucial to the plot, the man who made Superfly and perfected the toxic goop. I mean, ooze. Ooze! I like that. I like ooze that turned both he and the other mutants into what they are now. Baxter lamented that he never felt like he belonged or was accepted anywhere, feeling more akin to the animals he experimented on. Animal experimentation is like the gray area thing to end all gray area things to say the least. And what makes him even more indeterminable is the fact that we know nothing of why nobody seemed to accept him. Was he just awkward? Is he legitimately insane? Either way, the man's a genius and we'll hopefully learn more about him in the inevitable sequel. Oh, and fun fact, he was voiced by the actor who played Gus Fring from Breaking Bad. So on that note, let's go ahead and break bad and talk about the characters in the bad and evil section. While there's no shortage of henchmen seen throughout the series, they all belong to one of two significantly bigger bads. The first of these being newcomer villain and silver medalist of evil, Superfly. The man with a plan to eradicate humanity, Superfly is determined to release Baxter Stockman's ooze into the atmosphere, which is just... Ew. 
Why did he have to say it like that? To turn all the animals in the world into mutants. His plans for humans are to use them as slaves, entertainment, or just something stupid. To his credit, Superfly has a sympathetic motive. Humans took his father away at a very small age, leaving him to raise his mutant siblings by himself. When he tried to enter human society with the gang, they immediately retaliated. Unfortunately, Superfly is no splinter, as his solution, rather than simply living peacefully away from humans, was to murder all of them until he and his kind were the master race, and the only race. Now, as a human myself, I get why it would seem Superfly deserves the gold medal of evil. His plan is a legitimate threat to all humanity, and when he's transformed into Super Duper Fly, his pleasure in attacking both humans and his own fellow mutants is nothing short of disturbing. He also uses humans to help his plans, and kills them when he's done. Which is really messed up even before you consider Superfly's own plan being to eradicate all humans anyway. So he was basically having them do hard labor just to ultimately die by his hands. But like the other mutants, he at least did what he thought he absolutely had to, and had a somewhat sympathetic motive behind his monstrous deeds. But since he looks down on anyone who doesn't hold his own violent solutions in high regard, he more than earns the silver medal of evil. And while this may be controversial, we believe the gold medal of evil has to go to Cynthia Utram. This woman is seen from the start of the movie as the one who ordered henchmen to steal Baxter Stockman's mutating ooze. She intends to use mutant blood to create an army of mutant super soldiers. Her motives for this are unknown, though they almost definitely involve big money and power. But what we do know is that she brought Splinter's greatest fears to fruition by milking the poor turtles of their toxic ooze. Since we know little about Cynthia and her motives, what exactly justifies calling her more evil than Superfly? Well, here's the thing. Superfly and Cynthia were both willing to abuse and even destroy their opposing species, humans and mutants respectively, to reach their goals. They're also equally willing to use others as experiments expendable pawns. And that goes double for Cynthia, given how terrified her men are of her frowning on their failures. The difference, however, is that while Superflies would certainly be a greater threat to you and me, his motives were for his own people to live in peace and happiness across the earth. Cynthia, on the other hand, is draining mutants of their blood and essentially torturing them so that she can develop super soldiers to either sell for big money, sick on other humans for the sake of killing them, or both. Any way you slice it, a human both abusing mutants and and betraying humans is far worse than a mutant who views them as villains in their own eyes.